Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate seeing people I don't know, but uh, it's uh, been fabulous to reconnect with some friends who we haven't seen literally in decades, and that's the result of maybe an invitation and maybe an ad in the paper, but uh, I'm thrilled to see old friends and, and new faces as well. Um, the, uh, I should also thank uh, the Ontario Arts Council for favors received and the staff of um, McMaster Art Gallery that have been extremely helpful and uh, really led me to this installation that was absolutely tension free uh, and that's an unusual thing. So um, I want to start by just explaining where this body of work came from. Uh, in the early 2000s, I was interested in the Society of Andalusia, which is the period of, uh, of Muslim control of southern Spain. And it ended with the expulsion of the Muslims in 1492, when Isabella and Ferdinand took over and, be and began persecutions, began the Inquisition. But prior to that, there had been a wonderful period of harmony where the three religions got along in a way that could be seen to be enviable today. Uh, and I moved from that work into thinking about Jews and Muslims now and their very complicated and fraught relationships and how that could be expressed um, in visual material. Uh, and that was my challenge, and I've been doing that work uh, for seven or eight years. Um, what I see in the Middle East is not perhaps what students are learning in their post-colonial theory classes, um, where a colonial power uh, invades or takes over a land that uh, indigenous people are in and then exploit those people mostly for economic gain. Um, I think that the situation in the Middle East is different. There are two legitimate claims to the same territory. And here I'm uh, quoting Daniel Berenboim, who has done a lot of work trying to bring both Muslims and Jews together in orchestra, in a youth orchestra that has been uh, touring the world for many years. Um, that, I think, is the basis of the way that I did the work that's in here, uh, especially in these two pieces, these two installations, in which I would double the same thing but change it, uh, reverse the color, reverse the orientation, so that uh, the piece behind you, which I'm so grateful nobody knocked over, <laughs> is very light, um, is called Border. And if you saw it when you came in, you'll have seen that the background color on the other side is light and the subject, the flowers, tend to be dark and it's the reverse on this side. Um, so what you have is equivalence but different, difference. And so there, the equality is an important thing in my thinking and also the fact that obviously uh, the, the thinking of both peoples is not the same about the situation, but they're stuck with each other. And that's why they're on the same support, on either side of the same support. You could think of it as a fence or a wall. Um, these very beautiful flower images came from um, a little book that was my father-in-law's book. And it was sent to him I think before the Second World War, by a relative who he helped get out of Europe. This relative must have gone to Palestine. The, the story is half made up, but I'm trying to put things together. And sent him in gratitude a little book, this is it, called Flowers of the Holy Land. It has an olive wood cover and inside are real pressed flowers that are supposed to be, purported to be, from particular places in the Holy Land. So here's one, um, and let me put my glasses on, flowers of Silo, 
And the middle flower is maybe half an inch, and then there's some vegetation around it. So you see how tiny they are. Um, there's another one that I could point out to you. The light flower at the bottom here became, if I can find it, yes, it's, it's behind you. That one, right. So here it is. And these are the actual dried flowers. The book is maybe um, 90 or 100 years old. These books were produced in Palestine, mostly for Christian tourists, so that the flowers would be purported to be from holy sites like uh, Hebron and Nazareth and Jerusalem and so forth. Um, and these pilgrims would buy the books and uh, they survived, <laughs> you know, uh, not very many of them, but in our case, the flowers actually survived very well because the book hadn't been opened for, for decades. And so what I did was scan the flowers in this book uh, on a computer or had it done because at that time I didn't know anything about computers. And then these images were cropped and uh, treated through Photoshop and greatly enlarged, as you see, and uh, so that the border elements um, are these very, very tiny flowers. Uh, and they are from the area that's Palestine that's occupied now by uh, Israelis and Palestinians and probably Jordanians and other people, whatever was part of the British mandate. No, it just depends on where it's being installed. And, and uh, in this case, I like the idea of the light background against what you would see when you came in. So you would see a light background in that piece and a dark background in this one. Um, so I'll move on now. I'm moving on chronologically as well uh, to this piece called uh, Dictionary. Uh, the idea of it comes from language dictionaries in which a word is translated from English to French, French back to English, and that sort of thing. So there are two sides to this dictionary, which is an accordion book. Uh, on one side, as you can see, the Arabic is on the top. And on the other, if you walk around, um, and have a look, the Arabic will be at the bottom. So it's set up like a normal language dictionary with the two languages reversed. Um, the words at the top and the bottom describe the image in the middle. So that this is the word in Hebrew and Arabic for moon, for rope, for olive tree. And this is the title page you read from right to left. And then this also served as the back page. Uh, the, the whole tradition of still life is an interesting one because it was in the 19th century when these things mattered, I suppose, it was considered the least important way to paint. And therefore it was um, compatible with women painters and their aspirations so that the guys around would be painting huge heroic history paintings and uh, great portraits of leaders like Napoleon on their horses and any number of, of uh, adventure pictures, patriotic pictures, and you go down through landscape and, and individual portraits that are done for commissions, and right at the very bottom is still life. But in fact, uh, and you can go to a still life exhibition upstairs on the fourth floor that uh, describes the metaphors for the objects that are in still life paintings. Um, upstairs, the exhibition talks about materialism and the importance of material culture in the 17th century Dutch um, civilization. They were an exploring people and they were bringing things back from all of their colonies and uh, they were becoming very wealthy. 
And so that was celebrated in the pictures upstairs. On the other hand, a great many still life paintings warn the viewer that all of this beauty and acquisition is not going to last and you have to think about your moral self. Um, you have to consider matters of earthly and heavenly um, destinations and how you're going to fare in the next world. So if you see, for example, a bouquet of flowers that has um, petals falling down because the flowers are uh, ending their, their uh, kind of bloom, you know that immediately that metaphor means that the, um, your life is also ending, coming to an end, and you should consider what you've done and how you want to change. So the messages are really life and death messages, which is uh, the irony of placing this uh, category of painting at the very bottom of the heap, because it dealt with the most important issues uh, that humans have to face. Um, in choosing these images for this particular dictionary, um, I didn't I, I didn't think about them so much as I went to them intuitively. And I think of all of them as operating as metaphors, as in poetry, so that if you used a pomegranate in a poem, the association would be fertility and abundance. Um, and if you used rocks in a poem, it might be uh, something dangerous or something that you could build with. So that anybody who looks at these would have their own associations with them. Um, the, the way I did these was that first I started to do two paintings with a mirror image reversed and the text on the top and the bottom and I thought I'm going to lose my mind if I have to keep on doing these double paintings. I can't do it. So again the digital process worked for me and I started with, with 17 paintings that I did over a period of time and I brought one to show you. Here is the chain that you see toward the back. And so, uh, let me put it in the light a bit. I did a painting for each set of double prints and then I was able to, using Photoshop, reverse the placement of the text. I was able to turn the image 180 degrees and come up with these double panels. And so that's how it was done. It's, uh, the, this paper, by the way, um, I order it from the States. Uh, I met somebody in Boulder, Colorado in 1979 who owns um, an enterprise called Twin Rocker Handmade Paper. And this was the first time that that um, particular um, print ma ma paper making place had done anything this large and this heavy. So you'll see that it stands up by itself. I mean, it's great to use because when it falls off the wall, nothing happens to it. So I hope I'm not cursing myself with that comment anyway. So again, you'll see that I use the same kind of opposition connection as I do in the border piece, where um, things are the same but different. And they belong to one another, though they may be opposed. And so that is more or less where, where that kind of thinking um, stopped in uh, the work that I was doing. Um, the most recent work that I've done, uh, let me ask if there are any questions. Libby? <laughs> Do you have, uh, can you on the sequence of images? The sequence was again an intuitive um, placement. Uh, trying to get the reds to look right, trying to get a large 
um, image next to a more fragmented one. And um, also there, there should have been, but it didn't quite work out, um, a connection with the way the texts appeared. So it would either be together or apart as they are there, but it didn't quite work. So um, only God makes perfect things. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm satisfied that the, um, that the installation of it worked here. I also don't remember how it looked when I had it up before, so. Well, light is uh, ideas or a kind of opening up of a dark space, so it's a hopeful metaphor, I think, for, for both. I wouldn't say that, it, that that's what I think of it as, but I, I, as poets will tell you, they expect uh, differences in interpretation of their images, and often there's more than one explanation. It's also a lonely little light bulb. They're prints. You take a digital photo. That you can use in um, machines to produce prints. And you work on it first in Photoshop. You work on the image and you double it and you do whatever you want to to change the, um, uh, the kind of aspects of the work that you think maybe aren't quite right in the painting so that you have that liberty. No, no, it has nothing to do with traditional printmaking. And in fact, some traditional printmaking establishments like Open Studio in Toronto feel that it's a different process entirely and doesn't relate to any of the uh, processes that they, they do. It's an inkjet printer. Yeah, an Epson printer. So it didn't help it, I understand. Yeah. And there's... Uh, during the time I did this, I was using the printer at the Banff Center for the Arts, and they got, uh, the printers got better and better, the prices went down and down as the technology developed. So it was a very interesting um, surprise when I got my last bill. And, you know, I was expecting a huge shock, but it wasn't anything like a shock, it was just a very nice surprise. Um, and let's now move on to the paintings. The origins, there are two influences in these paintings. Um, one of them is Af uh, Afghanistani war rugs, and I don't know how many people have seen examples of those uh, in Toronto at the Textile Museum. They s circulated an exhibition, um, I don't know, three or four years ago. <clears throat> of Afghanistani war rugs, and they emerged when um, Russia invaded Afghanistan. And the, the tribes, the, they were there for a long time, 20 years, I think, and the tribes began to incorporate the war machines that they saw all around them into their traditional patterns. What they normally did was put a, uh, you know, have a rug uh, with a traditional pattern on uh, the border and then stick a bunch of tanks in the middle or trucks. So they didn't make any attempt or very few of them made attempts to incorporate uh, the, those particular images in a pattern way. They just had them there as single or isolated um, entities. And it was the kind of thing that they were seeing. Maybe, it was also an attempt to control something. I mean, that's what I feel about a lot of repetitive work, that you're trying to hold something down, you're trying to, to um, have mastery over it. And the repetition, I think, calms you. So I believe that's partly why these images appeared um, in, in these rugs. And the first painting, these are not in the order that I painted them, 
is this red one. And I started with this color because I had two red paintings left over from an installation in, uh, in 1999. And I didn't want to give them up. I liked the color and I thought that one day I'll have a use for them. And so I did. Now, when I started, I put in the two rows, the rockets and the planes facing each other, thinking about the weapons that the Israelis and Palestinians have, because the uh, Palestinians, uh, Hezbollah, have rockets, they don't have an air force, the Israelis have these uh, planes that make their situation superior. But I, I made them equal because I think that there are other ways in which inequalities on both sides kind of make the, the playing field a level one. I put those in without really knowing what was going to happen in the rest of the painting. And then I put in these abstract diamonds. And then I think that the medallion came last. This was my way of making a little house, houses that have fences around them. So that there's a blue line there, maybe like the green line, that uh, separates one house from another, puts a, a barrier behind it. Um, but thinking about this work, I also realized that it doesn't apply just to people in the Middle East or that particular situation. It's everybody, and that's most of the world, if you listen to the news and, and the horrors every day, that are suffering under this kind of, of uh, oppression. I'll go back for a minute, because I, I did talk about the Afghan war rugs, but I want to show you the other element that informed the way I painted these, and that's Palestinian cross stitch. And these, the women have done for a long, long time. Wait, where's the light? Uh, and these, they sell, they've been selling for years, but I, but I also associate that kind of handwork with the position of the victim, again, who has no control over whatever is happening in, in his or her world, in this case, her world, but is trying to hold things together to keep herself going, to keep whatever small group, fa the, uh, her family, whoever depends on her, from falling apart. And so it's a, a desperate repetition. And my cross stitches reflect that feeling. They did to me, anyway. Um, cross stitch, of course, is ubiquitous in, in many cultures. But the red and the black is particular to Palestinian women. So onward and upward. Um, this is the second painting that I did. And instead of using, um, having these things stand out as individual elements, so the rockets, you can see our rockets, they're not connected with anything else, I wanted to try and make patterns of the weapons to maybe demystify them or rob them of their power. And so this diamond that you see is a machine gun, four machine guns. The center um, quadrant is made with uh, rockets, the bottom here, the top there. And around the side are boats. So you wouldn't immediately, hopefully you wouldn't immediately know that these things were making up the patterns. And you might see it at first uh, as a rug, you know, or something that refers to that practice, which in fact this does, but also it contains these elements that are so antithetical to the traditional way of making rugs. These little cute round things are cherry bombs. Uh, and then there's a, a kind of tree image 
I haven't thought of all of these things through. I put things in as I had space for them, just as much as, uh, you know, for their meaning. But uh, that was what I was thinking uh, in the second one of trying to, um, to neutralize these bad things by making pretty things out of them. That's my um, revenge. Uh, this is the third painting. The reason that I, I challenge myself with different uh, approaches to each painting, first of all, the paintings take months to do, as you might imagine. But also, uh, if you try something a little bit different on the next painting, then you don't go stark raving mad. You're not repeating yourself. There are always surprises. So despite the fact that this looks so legislated and so um, kind of uh, fully formed, it isn't. And things happen, for example, in this one with the center medallion of helicopters. I um, went around this way to, to uh, have a pattern around them and, and did this. And then when I was putting the helicopters in, there was a huge space, which I filled with another um, row of pattern. But I had miscalculated by three inches, and that's my special gift. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can do the little things right, but, but the simple things, I don't know. Anyway, so what I did was, by adding that second um, row, I was able to complete the medallion. And this, on, in this painting, I was trying to make the foreground and background shift back and forth so that the darkness of these helicopters becomes the darkness of the background. Uh, in here, there are other uh, images. Here's a kind of flower, fleur-de-lis, but th this is a pair of handguns that face one another. Um, what else was I doing? I think the rest of it is more or less abstract, and I was borrowing and uh, doing riffs on the um, embroidery patterns of the Palestinian women. The um, fourth painting here It, I wanted to see what happened if I kept one of the groups of colors at more or less the same value. And I wasn't going to be worried about whether it, it bleached out or not. So that is, in fact, what did happen. That was the point. And I added uh, a couple of, of different patterns, but in the same vein. These um, tanks are new. And then these... Um, patterns here look like our machine guns, but then they formed a flower. Do you see that? And that was an accident. So I started in this case with the machine guns. I didn't know where else I was going, except that I knew that the color was going to uh, dilute the image it, so, so that the elements would come and go. The tank that you don't see here very well is quite clarified there. So that was that one. This one, the last, and I'm going to continue with this, I think, for maybe a couple more. Uh, and then maybe it will be time to change, but I wanted to try a couple of other things. Um, in this one, I wanted vertical panels. And I also began to gather, in each of these four paintings, there are little X's that are by themselves that kind of uh, shimmer. They're lighter than the other color, but, but the same color. Um, and here, I began to gather them together in clusters uh, without really thinking uh, as I did later, are they going to look like bloodstains? Are they going to refer to 
violence in that way, but I was just trying to deal with another element in the surface of the painting in a different way from what I had done before. Um, I don't know. Oh yeah, that, uh, Ted asked a question before we started, and that was why I changed the background colors so that you get a kind of landscapey feeling there. Um, and do I do that on purpose? Uh, when I start a painting, I take uh, very diluted colors, large amounts of them, and pour them across the paintings. And where they land is more or less where I start shifting the background color. Sometimes I make changes because the chance doesn't always work out in your favor. But um, I want them not to be as regular as, for example, that Palestinian um, pillow case that, that doesn't have any variation at all in the background color or in the black. So just from the point of view of my interest and maybe the surface of the painting, I wanted to make these variations as I do in all of the paintings. Um, and are there any questions? Because I think that's it for me. I don't know what's ahead, but um, what I have thought about on occasion is that art has moved away, and maybe students will be able to verify this, from concerns about the world and become hermetic and are considering philosophical issues around the whole uh, issue of art, how you paint, what you, um, I don't know, the choices that you make. It seems that they're becoming more academic. Maybe that earlier statement wasn't quite fair. And what I want to do is produce work that is accessible and meaningful in terms of the world that we live in. Um, I don't want to get involved in an argument about theory. I, I don't find it that interesting, and I believe that there's a certain excitement when you apply a theory to a situation and you think that it actually works, but more than, often than not, you're squeezing the theory into a place that doesn't actually fit. So I would like to remember the painters of medieval times when there were no people who could read and stories and important ideas were communicated by painters and everybody understood the iconography of those paintings. So hopefully when people look at my work they won't be baffled by it. There will be something there that they can understand or relate to and then maybe ask themselves some questions about it. I think that, uh, that we're done, but I, I really appreciate your comments. The, that discussion at the end was helpful to me. So thanks for coming and thanks for being so smart. <laughs>